Open your Bibles to Second Timothy, chapter two, verse three. For anyone that's been part of this ministry for the full sixteen and a half years, or part of the sixteen and a half years. This is a very familiar verse. I go to it often. In my personal studies this morning, early this morning, I revisit this verse, actually this chapter, once again. And verse 3 was my reminder. As I said before, I started preaching this message. This message is for me tonight. If it helps anyone else, so be it. Verse 3 reads, Thou, now this is Paul writing to Timothy. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I've had you circle the word soldier before or highlight it or underline it. Make sure you make it stand out in your Bible. The Greek word means to enlist into active service other soldiers. Paul in his writings quite often use militaristic language, military type language, to enlist into active service other soldiers of Jesus Christ. But back up to the beginning part of that verse. Thou therefore, and every time I read these next two words, I always cringe a little bit because I know how factual and true they become in anyone's life that becomes active in enlisting others into active service as soldiers of Jesus Christ. You get the attention of the enemy, the unseen enemy. That is the last thing the unseen enemy wants you to be participating in. Whether you're sharing the good news with someone or you're participating with me in this ministry. I've asked people to write in often. That's, an, that's a way you're participating to encourage me and others here that to fight this good fight of faith along with you. And it doesn't take very long for the weeks go by where you start slipping in that responsibility. And once again, I have to remind you how important it is, whether you realize it or not. Well, it's a two-way street, that's right. And you can have access to me and the teachings here 24-7. And all I ever do is ask for a few minutes of your day.
Thou therefore endure hardness. Greek is kakapateo. Kakapateo. It's a bunch of kako, right? You can add a potato. I have told you it's hardships, afflictions, trials, tribulations. Cock a potato. I always cringe at those two words because I know that it can't be avoided. Anyone that's doing anything for the cause of Christ, that matters. And underline what I just said, that matters. I'm telling you right now, you're going to face a whole bunch of a cock of a tail. Paul here is saying to Timothy, endure hardness. He was making it very clear to Timothy, and I think he's still speaking to us today. Endure hardness. Enduring hardness is a requirement. Like I said, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, of being a soldier, being a soldier in God's army. It's a requirement. It's not going to be left out. Paul was telling Timothy, hey, you're going to endure hardness because those afflictions and hardships are going to come. And you're probably going to get spiritually wounded, if not physically wounded, on the battlefield. It should be no surprise. Paul faced it. Paul's en Paul endured it many times. But you got to stay in the fight. If you're not in the fight, you got to join in with the rest of the faithful who are doing things for the cause of Christ that are faithfully fighting it out. You're going to have to get a grip with that whether you like to or not. You have to get a grip with a cock of a tail that comes at you. And many times it will get worse before it even gets better, if it gets better. Now I know I don't sound like most preachers. Most preachers are spewing out Prosperity, doctrine, this or that. I'm not just talking about finances. Lift me up type messages because I need it. At least they think I need it. To carry on my responsibilities and duty to my captain of my salvation. They're not repairing the saints for the harness. They're not instructing them about, about, they will have to somewhere, probably many times endure hardness in their spiritual journey. They're going to have to face their fears. They're going to have to suffer to get what God has appointed you to do for the cause of Christ. You might have to, get, have to suffer be, to get the job done. Whatever God has called you to do, do and participate in. Endure hardness. I wrote an additional definition that I have discovered that could be applied to this word Cockapateo. Write it down. To bear without breaking or yielding to force or pressure. To bear without breaking or yielding to force or pressure. By trusting God, you're not going to sink under the pressure. And 
I repeat, you're going to endure that hardness because your activity in listing other individuals to fight the good fight of faith, to enlist into active service other soldiers into God's army. You want to have some of the pressure, the cockabateo, off your back? Stop doing anything for the cause of Christ. I guarantee you. Giving is one of those things you can stop. If you're giving to, to a ministry that is rightly dividing the word of God, Satan and his minions want you, to, want you to stop that activity and stop it quickly. And they'll do anything they can for that to happen. Do you believe all this unseen warfare that's going behind the scenes that we can't even see? Yeah, I do. There's plenty of examples of that throughout Scripture. But let's continue. Endure hardness as a good soldier. I think it is circled the word good there because it's key also. It describes a type of soldier in God's army. Now, I'm probably going to preach another message on some of those characteristics in the near future. Not tonight. So circle it. It's kalos, K-A-L-O-S. This could have been a, it's Greek to me lesson tonight, but no, I want to keep it as a spiritual warfare lesson. Kalos in the Greek. What is the scribe? And there's all kinds of definitions for it out there, and you have to be careful who you believe. A good, in relation to, in this context, to what Paul was trying to communicate was someone that was capable, fit for duty. God's word makes you fit. Faith in Jesus Christ makes you fit. Fit for duty, capable, strong, and firm. Strong and firm. Capable, fit, firm, and strong. Write those down. <clears throat> Paul was not just describing some ordinary soldier out there. He was describing a strong, firm, capable, fit-for-duty soldier in spiritual terms. You have to keep in mind, Paul is writing to Timothy, but he was writing, this, this, his letters would go out and distribute it to, not the letter itself, not letters, but maybe copies, who knows. But <clears throat> the information, at least in these letters, would circulate. And Paul know, knew he was writing to Timothy, who was living in a Roman Empire world that had conquered most of the known world at that time. So the type of language he uses and the symbolism that goes with it was fairly significant. People that have done any studies and the Roman history, especially its Roman soldiers, would come quickly to understand that they were skilled, they were disciplined, they were fierce, they were committed, and they were driven. And they're fighting for something that was not for the cause of Christ. How, must, how more so to have those characteristics in the spiritual realm in understanding what we were called to do. 
in how we should respond. Throughout the New Testament, throughout Paul's letters, you see this military language that he would use to communicate to the churches, to his pupils, to his students, to his fellow prisoners, to his fellow workers. I don't think it's by accident that Paul used these type of words in describing what we are to be aware of to prepare us for anything that would come our way, in this case, to Timothy's way. And also what God expects from us and from any member in the body of Christ. I have people ask me all the time, what does it take to be a leader in the body of Christ? Well, you want the additional pressure? You want the additional heat? Or better yet, if you don't want the additional pressure, you don't want the additional heat, don't become a leader in the body of Christ. Because the assignment will set you apart. from other folks. I'm not saying the lay person is not important and I'm ne I've never have said they're not involved in the battle. But leaders, pastors are subject to attack that has a different kind of intensity and the frequency I believe. than those who are the lay per people, the lay person. Why? Because Satan knows the positions of leadership and how important they are in the five-fold ministry that you read about in another Paul letters to the Ephesians. Ephesians 4. And he goes to work with his evil, diabolic plan to destroy any apostle. An apostle just means a messenger, prophet in our day and age, one that knows how to discern and interpret what we have in the book, say for an example, Revelation. Evangelists, pastors, teachers. He goes on the attack and he brings it in his really big guns. He knows if he can hit a leader and knock that leader down and get that leader out of the battle, he delivered a significant blow and wounded a part of the body of Christ with that one blow, that attack against the leader. That's why I say, pray for your leaders. I'm not talking about the politicians. You can pray for the politicians. Everyone needs prayer. But the ones that truly matter are the ones that are doing things for the cause of Christ, for the kingdom. What am I saying? We're smack in the battlefield, my friend. Smack in the middle of the battlefield. In the midst of a raging war. Paul knew it. He used militaristic language that describes the spiritual life. Now the church in 2021 don't understand that. It doesn't compute, mostly because the pastors have not instructed their congregations how Paul communicated. But the early Christians 
understood clearly the kind of language Paul was using, using. And they had a very militaristic view of themselves. When I say militaristic, I'm not talking about physical violence. So don't twist what I'm saying. But they saw them as a militaristic person involved in God's army, the Lord's army, for a cause that Christ wanted them to be involved in and to carry out the Great Commission. To take the world, to take every nation and evangelize it and bring people to that change of mind experience that would set them free and start them on a spiritual journey that Christ will put them on as he changed them, molds them into active soldiers also. Those early Christians had no confusion. There was no doubt what their mission was. And that was to change the world. And of course, change the course of history for all time. You think they just became couch potatoes and just sat around waiting for another wave of the Spirit? Another movement of the Spirit before they rose up to do anything for the cause of Christ? They received the power. They received the Holy Spirit. They knew exactly what Jesus wanted them to do. And friends, for most of them, they did it. You can't say that any longer. You just can't. Most Christians go to church or go to whatever they go to to try to experience the next, next, the next emotional jitter up, the, up and down their spine. That makes them feel good. These early Christians knew exactly what they had accomplished, no, had to accomplish, that was part of the Great Commission. And they were willing to sacrifice themselves to get it done. Yeah, Pope Paul mentions being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he often spoke of being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Read the epistles that he wrote. He refers himself to being a soldier. He referred to Timothy as a soldier. And here might be the shocker of this evening. He even referred to Jesus as a soldier. Well, what do you mean? Well, you see there in verse 3, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, circle that word of. Good soldier of Jesus Christ. That two-letter word in the English could actually translate it like. I think it should have been. Paul was really saying, be a good soldier like Jesus Christ. Jesus was a soldier. We have no problem. You shouldn't be shocked to say he was the captain of my salvation. In fact, he's more than captain. He's the leader of captains. He's the leader of generals. 
He is the Son of God. Paul didn't cut no slack to his flesh or anyone else's. He knew what his, he knew what his commitment was all about. He knew why he was called of God. And he did whatever was required for him to do to complete his mission that God had called him to do. He had a militaristic mentality. There's no doubt about it. In all his relationships and even in his writing, in his epistles. You don't believe me? Go to Romans. Chapter 16. Start with verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also are in Christ before me. He greeted the saints in Rome with militaristic language. He didn't say to the saints in Rome, say hi for me, say hello for me, like we would do today. He said, salute, Atronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Does that sound like normal church talk to you? If you go to your, a, a church, a physical building somewhere on Sunday or Saturday or whenever you go, notice when you enter through the entrance of that church. Notice it about yourself and notice it about others. Do, do you salute those people when entering the building? Do they salute you back? Have you ever been called the prisoner of the Lord? Or have you ever called anyone else the prisoner of the Lord? Do you even hear that, any of that kind of conversations in the church world today? Maybe some churches up in Canada, pastors have resisted from shutting down. But those are far and few between. What Paul was, by saluting, is express, expressing a strong respect for others who were on the battlefield along with them, fighting a real battle in a raging war. Some of them were physically imprisoned. Why? Because they courageously preached the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some were enduring persecution because of their faith. You don't think the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ wasn't highly controversial? They made it political back then also. How dare the gospel, how dare the Son of God demand allegiance to himself. As far as Rome was concerned, that's demanding allegiance to another higher power outside of Caesar. And that was not acceptable. And because of that, those early New Testament Christians, including Paul, suffered for the gospel. Just like soldiers who have been ca captured by hostile forces. We have lost this type of language. The language of the New Testament true church. We have lost it. See, 
warfare and persecutions and hardships and tribulations for the cause of Christ were realities for them. You think they had the luxury of being just church people? It's summertime. Churches around the world, especially the United States, just look at some of their programs and their calendars. I have. Fun days all through the summer. From picnics to baseball games to all types of outings for Jesus. The church has become useless. If they don't have Let's turn the world upside down. Mentality. You think those early New Testament believers view them as simply as the congregation? Something that was made up about six, seven hundred years later, by the way. And when we get the word congregation, they believed they were in the army of God. They believe they're in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just simply congregation members. See, Jesus gave the early church the Great Commission. And those early ch church believers took it very seriously. Matthew 28. <clears throat> Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, disciple all nations, Verse 20, teach them to preserve all things where I have commanded thee, I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. You go to Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come unto you. A better translation, the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And underline the next few words. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. <clears throat> See, this tells me that they did believe they were commissioned to take the, the, the gospel to the entire earth for Jesus Christ. This tells me they were committed to take the world. Not the simple little programs church, churches have come up with to support, with minimal funds, by the way, most of them, missions. So they could establish a little mission that really doesn't reach that many people. And they could wash their hands and have a clean conscience saying that, well, we were involved in taking the gospel to the other most parts of the world. No, it just became another thing off their checklist, thinking they fulfilled what God has commanded them to do. You know what they've done? 
they have taken the Great Commission and made it the Puny Commission. I've said this before, that's why I decided not to start church in a church building in some corner in any town USA. My heart and mind was driven to reach as many as I could with the capabilities that God has provided me to get that job done. I didn't have the mentality to go to every nation and to try to win some if that was possible. How can you call that great? What type of commission is that? You think that's what Jesus intended? You think Jesus just intended it for us to reach just a few people? And call it a day? And rest in our laurels for the remainder of our lives? Now the attention of Jesus was that His true church would rise up fit, capable, strong and firm to turn the world upside down with the news about Jesus. He wanted us to be militant in our faith. So we could literally reach the entire world in every person of every nation could have the opportunity to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you, well isn't that already accomplished with TV? You think the right and divided word is being spread to everywhere just because there's television or radio or internet? I've been looking into ministries in relation to the change of mind message. God help us. And by the way, I get people constantly asking me, well, can you recommend some books? Can you recommend this? Can you recommend that? Now, once in a while, I might read an author. But let me tell you what my experience, experience has been. I'm lucky to get 5% of any particular author or book that I have read and apply it to how, what does say the word Lord. preaches through his word. They twist things constantly. They form a different type of theology and doctrine that doesn't come out of the God's word. That's why I don't recommend much. Occasionally I might read something and some of you think I support that author all of a sudden. I'm telling you the only author I can support is this. God and His Word. And if I able, am able to get something out of somebody else's work, to me, in good conscience, I'm not going to recommend it to you so you can spend anywhere from $15 to $30 to buy their material to get a couple senses out of the book. Keep listening to me and more importantly, keep digging into the scriptures. I don't know how I got off of that, but that's for everybody that asks me constantly. 
give us some recommendations. I can't. And I won't. I did it once on the Lost Tribes. But that was mostly history. Let's continue. Where was I? Yes. Those, those New Testament early believers were militant in their faith. They believed in a worldwide conversion. I'll give something to the Muslims. They want to convert everyone. Now, they're following a false god. But they got their commission down, right? In doing so, if only Christians had that mentality. See, those early New Testament Christians knew that the church needed Jesus. If you, we just read Acts 1.8. Write it down because I have it marked in my Bible and I'll go straight to it. Psalms 2.8 because I'm running out of time. The parallel verse, now this is a Masonic Psalm that points to the Anointed One. But in verse 8, it says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. This is referring to the anointed one. But you know how Jesus also took this verse, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, and when you read Acts, I don't think it's by accident or a coincidence that he says, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. What, what is my commission now becomes your commission also. They had a militaristic mentality to reach the world. They were committed to it. They were committed to the faith. They were going to turn this world upside down and their mentality and take it for Jesus Christ. Even meant giving up their lives for it. Many early Christians were thrown in jail and many were murdered. Yet, they continue. They defied Satan. They outlasted the Roman Empire. And they, in fact, changed the world forever. Or else we wouldn't have what we have today. It would have died. Those early believers view themselves as a militant church. And I repeat, not with physical violence. No. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It makes it very clear. So I'm not misinterpreted. <clears throat> I'm getting there. Verse 4. For the weapons are of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's not a physical violence. It's a spiritual militaristic response that we should have for the cause of Christ. And our weapons of this warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. Christ has provided us with fully equipped spiritual armor to drive back the forces of hell and get the good news of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ out there. I'm going to go to back to Paul. In chapter 16. And I'm about ready to close.
Remember I told you in verse 5, salute. In verse 7, salute. Don't tell me Paul didn't use militaristic language. He uses it over and over and over. He continues saluting in verse 7, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, 15, 16. He salutes out of respect to these fellow faithful warriors, soldiers of Jesus Christ. His fellow warriors in the Lord's army. It's as, as Paul was saying, tell the faithful in the Lord's army for me, I salute them. Just think how powerful the church today would have been if we had the same type of mentality. If we have the same th type of thinking. The reason why Paul f phrased all this in militaristic language is because he knew he was fighting in the combat zone. He knew he was fighting in the battlefield. And that's what he's reminding Timothy. And what to expect as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And you know where good soldiers find themselves fighting? On the front lines. It's time more of you get on the front lines and it's time more of you, especially those who have been around for a while now, for you to make that commitment and say, you know, he's not going to remind me constantly of what my responsibilities as an active soldier in God's army is all about. I have to remind myself that. You should be able to remind yourself of those, that same thing without having me remind you constantly of what your responsibilities to Christ. He's the one that recruited you. So start acting like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Get on the battlefield and be ready for combat. Now I want to hear from you. Play this song.